Is our load balancing method a good choice? That is a question we should be asking ourselves because not all load balancing methods are the same. Maybe we chose something that's working subpar for our environment. Hey, it's possible. So let's take some time and go through and do a little review on some load balancing methods. All right, starting off with where do we set the load balancing method? Well, when we go into the big IP, of course, we're going to go into our pools. We're going to select our pool and go to the members tab. And there we go. That is where we're going to set our load balancing method. Here we can see it is set to round robin. Okay, now that we had a quick review of where we go ahead and set this at, and again, remember, this isn't within the virtual server. It's within the pool that we set the load balancing method. Let's talk about some dynamic load balancing options, such as least connections. So when we have our client over here, our big IP over here, and our pool members over here, we're going to be load balancing based on the least number of connections. And this works best in situations where our pool members over here have very similar capabilities, meaning CPU and memory resources. So if these are all very similar, then they're going to be able to handle just about the same number of sessions each. So that works well with the least number of connections because the only thing the big IP is concerned about is how many connections each of these pool members has. If this one has 20 connections and this one has uh, maybe 21 connections and this one only has 15, well, the next time a session comes in from a client, it's obviously going to be sent over here because this pool member has the least number of connections. So that's where it's going to be load balanced too. All right, it's very key to remember, this is a good fit for situations where the pool members have very similar capabilities. Next up, fastest. So what is fastest used for? Well, it's used in situations where we have pool members located across different networks. So for instance, we've got our client over here, our big IP right here, and our pool members. Now the big IP could be, let's say in data center number one, and then over here we have data center number two, super. And I've got a pool member over here, let's say two pool members. And then I've also got two pool members over here. There we go, super. And again, these are in the same pool. We'll call this pool A, super. So what happens is the big IP, it looks at who has the fastest response times and it then prefers those pool members. So when a client connects in, it's going to say, hey, who has the fastest response time? And it's going to load balance accordingly. Now, obviously, the servers in the same data center as the big IP are going to have the fastest response times. These over here in data center two, well, they're going to have a little slower response time, so they're not going to be load balanced to as often. So when you're using this type of setup, you really need to be aware of that. Now, when you use the fastest load balancing method in a scenario like this, obviously these local pool members are going to bear the brunt of the traffic. And this is going to give your clients the best user experience because those that are being directed over here to this other data center could see a slower connection. They may see some latency going on. And it all depends on what type of connection resides between these two data centers. So that is your fastest load balancing method. Moving on, we're going to talk about least session and weighted least session. Now this load balancing method relies on persistent sessions. So if you're not using persistence, then you're not going to be able to use these two options. They do rely on persistence. It has to be there, otherwise they're not going to work because they make their decisions based on the number of persistent sessions per pool member. Now, when it comes to least session, well, it's looking at the least number of persistent sessions. So we've got our client, we've got our big IP, 
got a pool members over here and when that connection comes in it's going to check that persistence table to see who in that pool has the least number of persistent sessions so again if this one has eight this one has 12 and this one has 15 well obviously this server here will be given the next incoming connection because it has the least number of persistent sessions but there's also weighted least session and that's where you can add a weight to one or more of your pool members to ensure that they receive more or less of the connections so you're basically providing some affinity here and you may want to do this because maybe this server up here our server a let's say it has a lot of cpus and memory whereas these two down here have less resources and so you want to ensure that server a receives more sessions than server b or c down here all right so that's our least session and weighted least session and the key here is it relies on your persistence if you're not using persistence you won't want to use these two options and lastly we come to observed and predictive now with these two the big ip creates a ratio based on the number of active layer 4 connections that a host has over time so if we have a client down here we've got our big ip and of course pool members so what happens is the big ip is creating a ratio it's using an algorithm to do this to watch who has the most number of active layer 4 sessions and this is over a period of time so really what it's doing is it's observing the amount of traffic that's going back and forth and it's trying to predict who has more work to do so that it can decide which host it should be load balancing to and this is particularly effective in environments where your performance between members varies significantly so again if this host here has a lot of cpu and memory whereas these two have less cpu and memory well then they have less resources and their performance is going to vary so when you have pool members that vary significantly in the resources you're really going to want to use one of these observed or predicted because it's going to help give you better load balancing results all right so that wraps up our review of our load balancing methods and when it's best to use them in the next nugget we're going to go through a couple different scenarios and discuss which would be the best load balancing method to use in those scenarios so i'll see you there shortly thanks for watching and subscribe here to get the latest from cbt nuggets and if you're interested in it career or learning more about it in general hey swing by cbtnuggets.com and sign up for a free trial